We're going to start by looking at finance, and this is in the context of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which was a commitment by the financial institutions to really accelerate the availability of sustainable finance. But we're going to begin with um, the experience of NatWest, and in particular, the experience of NatWest's head of climate strategy implementation, Gary Kendall. Now, now Gary has had a unique career background that has led him to be really committed to making finance work for climate. And Gary has kindly agreed to share some of his personal story, as well as some of the corporate story of NatWest. We're looking forward to that. Please welcome to the stage, Gary Kendall. <clears throat> Thanks, Gary. Thanks. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, that was a really helpful tee up, because um, I want to begin with a disclosure. Um, and the disclosure is that, and the organizers of this event will attest that I had some misgivings about coming and speaking here today. Um, and that's because after 17 years working on climate change um, and sustainability, I know that we're running out of time and we need to move beyond beauty pageants. And so, self evidently lacking any personal stylist. Um, I stand before you not primarily as head of climate strategy implementation at NatWest Group, not as senior associate of the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, and nor for that matter as someone with a curious fetish for ostentatious and long-winded job titles, <laughs> but actually here primarily as a concerned citizen and a human member of the community of life. Um, because what we're facing is not actually an engineering problem. It's first and foremost a cultural problem. Um, and this realization is simultaneously daunting and liberating. It creates the freedom and the necessity to recalibrate our expectations, reimagine our politics, and reconfigure our economies. And I'm going to, as, as Greg alluded in the introduction, I'm going to revisit my personal trajectory over the last 26 years. Um, not because I think it's particularly unique or special or interesting, but because it helps to contextualize the contribution I'm going to make over the next 15 minutes or so. So, I'm a natural scientist. Um, I have a PhD in physical chemistry, and I began working in the oil and gas sector in 1997, when the atmospheric CO2 concentration was 364 parts per million. I worked for ExxonMobil for nine years in various downstream roles, um, commercial roles across the UK, mainland Europe, the United States, and finally China. And this is China, for anyone who wondered. And I lived in Beijing from 2004 to 2006, and, and in those two years, the automotive population of Beijing grew from 2 million to 3 million. And that's 50% growth in the number of motorized vehicles over 24 months. Astonishing rate of growth. And my direct experience of living and working in China during that period was my awakening to the fact that our prevailing development model, which I describe as extractive, exploitative, exclusive, and excessive, is fundamentally broken. And so I began my search for leverage points, seeking places to intervene in the system to bring about changes that are both necessary and profound. And I began that search by joining WWF, the, the, the World Wide Fund for Nature, in case anybody thinks I have a curious anatomy for a wrestler. <laughs> and the first thing I learned at WWF was that my friends and former colleagues at ExxonMobil were not bad people in any sense. 
They were generally decent, well-educated and disciplined professionals behaving in accordance with a complex system of incentives. And many of those incentives are lousy. And they'll have to change quite fundamentally if we're to avoid bringing about the collapse of civilization. But stepping back for a moment, let's reflect that the essential purpose of all life forms is energy capture and deployment in the service of growth and development. Photosynthesis is thought to have emerged about three billion years ago as the mechanism through which plants and algae capture energy from sunlight and convert it into chemical energy. Photosynthesizers are the batteries of the natural world, taking solar energy flow and storing it as a chemical energy stock, which may be accessed later by other living organisms. And one species, ours, later discovered that this chemical energy may also be liberated by combustion. So ancient sunlight has been stored as biomass and locked away in the crust as coal, oil and gas over hundreds of millions of years. But discharging that battery takes a fraction of the time. Since the Industrial Revolution kicked off in the UK in the 18th century, as a species, we've been increasingly living off this battery, releasing millions of years' worth of ancient sunlight in the blink of an eye. And this act has enabled us to seemingly trump natural laws, expanding our numbers to 8 billion, while bringing unimaginable levels of material prosperity to many, but by no means all of us. And to the extent that much of our consumption is frivolous, it's been said that the modern economy effectively converts millions of barrels of oil into microliters of dopamine. Our fossil energy system provides the labor equivalent of several hundred billion human slaves working around the clock on our behalf. We don't experience the cost of their formation, only the cost of their liberation. And the mechanism by which we allocate those energy resources is money. The economy is not a financial system, it's a physical system in which money is a claim on energy. All real economic activity requires energy to flow, and money is the token that we use to direct energy flow. And overwhelmingly, that's the flow of ancient sunlight from the stock of fossil fuels. And because money is created as interest-bearing debt, the economy has an inbuilt obligation to grow. And economic growth has, until now, meant an ever-increasing throughput of energy and materials. So after two years working at WWF, my search for leverage points took me into the world of consulting and think tankery with an organization called Sustainability, based in London. And what I learned at Sustainability was that climate change isn't actually the problem. It's a symptom of an underlying problem. And the underlying problem is that our economic system is in ecological overshoot, even as it fails to deliver what it says on the tin which is to meet universal human needs. Climate change is like the fever that accompanies the malaria infection. It's certainly the fever can be fatal, but you'd want to know that your physician had correctly diagnosed the underlying condition, the root cause, and treated it effectively. However, in the comparatively wealthy global north, it's easy to become afflicted with this condition called carbon tunnel vision, to reduce the sustainability challenge down to a single objective, decarbonization. And I caricature this approach as doing what we've always done, but with less smoke coming out. And then 11 years working in South Africa thoroughly disabused me of this affliction. And for the first three years in South Africa, I worked in Cape Town with the University of Cambridge, 
the Institute for Sustainability Leadership. And I was running, designing and running four-day seminars aimed at giving corporate and public sector executives a sheep dip into systems thinking. And the first thing I learned in South Africa was that there is no useful delineation to make between economic, social, environmental, political, financial, and technological issues. These are all merely different lenses through which to analyze complex systemic challenges. For example, the water crisis in Cape Town some five years ago could only be fully appreciated and understood through all of these different lenses. It was simultaneously an economic, social, environmental, political, financial, technological challenge. And the next thing I learned in South Africa is that extreme inequality, aside from evoking strong feelings of injustice, presents a colossal coordination challenge. In simple terms, it's very hard to make policies that get traction when one's constituents span an enormous breadth of socioeconomic circumstances. And I don't believe it's too much of a stretch to assert that South Africa represents a microcosm of the global sustainability agenda. This photographic depiction of extreme wealth inequality here represents, in a handful of hectares, the hugely divergent global priorities that we're going to have to reconcile if we're going to thread the needle on sustainable development. And this is why the UNFCCC is so important. This is why the COPs are so important. It's an imperfect process, certainly, but as a platform for building transparency, trust, and cooperation at the level of nation states with different developmental contexts facing very different consequences and different capabilities. It's the best that we've got. I took this photo during the closing stages of COP21 in Paris almost eight years ago, just before the gavel came down on the Paris Agreement. And this was shortly after I'd swapped academia for finance, having moved from Cape Town to Johannesburg to work for one of South Africa's big four banks. So my search for leverage, or during my search for leverage, what I'd come to understand is that finance creates the future every single day. When banks and investors make lending and investment decisions. Because it's the allocation of capital that causes energy to flow, and nothing in the real world happens without energy being converted from one form into another. So finance is the ground zero of our net zero mission. But the difficult truth is that eight years on from Paris, the atmospheric CO2 concentration is now 421 parts per million, up from 364 when I'd graduated and joined Exxon 26 years ago. And the decarbonization trajectory continues to steepen. And that's because the rise in global temperatures is linearly related to cumulative emissions, which means that for any given probability of stabilization at any given temperature, so for instance, for a two-thirds chance of stabilizing at 1.5 degrees, we must manage within a finite carbon budget. Now, had we started our decarbonization journey as recently as 2000, the trajectory would have looked like this. So this is for a two-thirds chance of stabilizing at one and a half degrees. Annual emission cuts of between one and two percent would have sufficed. And the carbon budget would have stretched to the end of the century. But we didn't do that. Not only did we fail to do that, in fact, we accelerated our emissions for the next two decades, such that had we started in 2010, in 2020, I beg your pardon, emissions needed to fall by 7 to 8 percent each year and reach zero by 2050. So by delaying 20 years, 
we've lost 50 years. We have to get to zero 50 years earlier. So in my former role at the South African Bank that I mentioned, in light of this understanding, I grew fond of asking executives a provocative rhetorical question, which was, if we were going to take this agenda seriously, what would we look like? And the inference being that I didn't think we were taking it seriously. So, in my search for leverage points, I found a bank that I thought provided a very persuasive answer to that rhetorical question. So NatWest is a purpose-led bank that set itself climate-related ambitions aligned to the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Earlier this year, we became the first UK bank and one of the largest banks in the world to have our targets validated by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. We're trying to change the bank and change the commercial offer in accordance with these ambitions. We know this is necessary but not sufficient because alone we can't succeed in the transition to net zero. So we also have to change the public discourse and help to change the rules of the game. So although the transition that we've begun reveals a vast commercial opportunity space, we can't close the gap unless the wider system incentives are brought into register with the global decarbonisation imperative. And that's why NatWest CEO Dame Alison Rose is a member of the GFAN's principles group. It's why our head of climate change, James Close, is an enthusiastic participant at the working group level. What the UNFCCC is to nation states, GFANS is to the financial system. It aims to build trust and transparency and align the incentives of asset owners, asset managers, banks, and the real economy to align those incentives with the outcomes that we all want, as expressed in the Paris Agreement and the Glasgow Climate Pacts. So drawing to a close, um, I want to remind everybody of the words of Mark Carney, co-chair of GFANS, um, speaking in 2015 as governor of the Bank of England. He said that climate change is the tragedy of the horizon. The catastrophic impacts will be felt beyond the traditional horizons of most actors, imposing a cost on future generations that the current generation has no direct incentive to fix. That means beyond the business cycle, the political cycle, and the horizon of technocratic authorities like central banks who are bound by their mandates. In other words, once climate change becomes a defining issue for financial stability, it may already be too late. So in conclusion, we find ourselves at a unique moment in history. Something extraordinary is going to happen in the next three decades. Our culture will learn to live sustainably, or it won't. Either way, it will be extraordinary. Thanks very much. Gary, the word I want to begin with is thank you. I think that you've brilliantly set the tone for the whole conversation that's to come. I don't need to repeat what you said, but almost every phrase was striking. Billions of years of the storing of solar energy in our natural environment being unleashed in a concentrated and accelerated matter in a short period of time with consequential effects that involve both feedback loops and acceleration mechanisms. You said that the COPs are important because it creates an opportunity for transparency and trust and cooperation that otherwise wouldn't exist. We live in a, a, an era of nation states, so we need nation states. You said that banks have a really critical role to play in applying the system of finance to the real economy because it's the real economy that uses energy and it's finance that enables and induces that. 
You said finance is the ground zero of the net zero transition. And you also said that if we take seriously the idea of what does our economy need to look like to reverse this process of releasing all of this towards solar energy, we begin to think, of course, in a different way. And then you said very clearly that the reason that you ultimately joined NatWest was because you, you believe it was a purpose-led bank that's trying to do this with transparency, with trust, and to embrace the transition. And you saw GFANS as a mechanism for achieving some coordination between financial sector players so that they can do this together and have some collective transparency. Sorry for going through all of that, but I think every point of logic in your, in your, in your argument was very, very clear. So um, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and then we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to move on. But the question I really want to ask you first, then, is so for people in the room who are not familiar with what banks are doing in this space, um, what is the difference that makes some finance sustainable and other finance not sustainable? Yeah, it's a really good question. And first, Greg, thanks for summing up in about 75 seconds what I took about 15 minutes to try and explain. <laughs> but, um, so, oh, excuse me. Um, so what separates sustainable finance from unsustainable finance? I'm not sure. So, I mean, I, I actually struggle on some level with the term sustainable finance because mm. It, it does kind of call into question, well, what's the rest of finance? Mm -hmm. um, I think what's, what banks do is effectively, banks manage risk. Mm -hmm. And the way that they manage risk historically has been linked to, well, has been linked to the history of, um, you know, let's say, um, a business comes into a bank for a loan, okay, we want to see five years of management accounts, we want to kind of understand your cash flows based on historical trends, and we want to get an idea for how that's going to extrapolate into the future. Um, and given the profundity, the, the kind of the depth and the speed of the transition that we're going through, mm. that's becoming a flimsy heuristic mm. for understanding risk. And so really what this is about is pricing risk better so, I mean, my, my job title um, is Head of Climate Strategy Implementation at, at NatWest, and, and I struggle with it. Because I think if you have a climate change strategy, you're probably thinking about it the wrong way. Mm. You have a strategy, and it's, it's either more or less coherent with what we understand about climate change. Mm. Climate change isn't a box on your strategy diagram, it's the paper upon which you write your strategy. It's the context. Mm. And so getting a better understanding of what's going on here enables banks to be better at pricing for risk. And the things that we'd considered in the past to be low risk may actually turn out to be uh, pathways of regret. Mm. And the things that we perceive to be higher risk because they're uncertain and emergent and new and novel and innovative, maybe those are the things that are going to create this future that we need and we have to price those accordingly. Great. So second question from me. I mean, I, I, am, I imagine you're a man who spends a lot of time reflecting on what's going on and, and you meet hundreds of people every month who are involved with this. What are the points of action that you think um, give you some optimism in all of this? And I, I, I appreciate there's not much optimism to be had, but where, who is doing the right things and where do you see that happening? Yeah, <laughs> it is a tricky one. I mean, what gives me optimism is that events like this are happening and audiences like this are coming together to have this conversation. Um, and I think, you know, I, I made the point at the beginning that, that I, I'm tiring of beauty pageants. And, and the reason I came today is because Lisa and the, the um, Glasgow Chamber had persuaded me that this wasn't going to be a beauty pageant and this could actually be a place where we could have an honest conversation. Mm. So I think what gives me encouragement is that we are creating these spaces for these honest conversations. And 
you know, we, we need to, all of us, move past this kind of dance where we're kind of standing up and, and parroting all the things that you can find on our website, all the things that have been through our corporate affairs department and our, you know, um, strategic comms. You can find all that. If you want to understand what NatWest is doing, and believe me, it's a very, very impressive story, it's all there on our website. But we've got to get past that and understand that all of us are first and foremost human beings and secondarily employees and representatives of our organization. And we've got to solve this together. And there's, what makes human beings special is not our propensity to cooperate. Sorry, is not, it is our propensity to, I beg your pardon, it's not our propensity to compete and to fight and squabble. It's our propensity to cooperate because we're a, first and foremost a social species. And that's why we've been successful up to this point. And that's the only thing that's going to sort of, that's the only human quality that's going to take us through the eye of the needle. Right, Gary, thank you very much. What I'm enjoying so much in, uh, in this conversation is you, your honesty and your dedication to being really uh, honest with everyone here in the room. There's a sincerity about this that's very important. I'm going to ask you one more question, which is, um, if today is a productive day and it's a useful day, what do you think could or should come out of it? Well, that's, that's a difficult one to answer. Um, I, I hope that, that everybody leaves here in, with absolutely no doubt that there's a bit of a paradox here in, 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 climate, in the climate discourse. The paradox is that we're running out of time, so we have to slow down. Right? We really have to slow down and think very, very carefully about our next step. This sustainability problem has been described as, as, as like a quicksand problem. We're, we're up to here in quicksand, and what you know from the old action movies is you don't struggle. The, the more you struggle in the quicksand, the faster you sink. You have to think very, very carefully about which steps you're taking. And, and that's what I hope comes out of an event like this. It's the, that we, we're at a moment, we've got a, a small window in which we can still determine how we decarbonize. We will decarbonize, there's no question about it. What's open for debate is whether we're going to do it by design or by disaster. And I'd rather we do it by design. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Dr. Gary Kendall.